Hey, we're continuing our um, story, The Hardy Boys, The House on the Cliff, with Chapter 11, Cliff Watchers. Frank, Joe exclaimed, I think you've hit it. That man had no reason to act that way, the way he did, unless he's covering up something. Something like smuggling, you mean, said Chet. He must be snapping, or one of his gang. And, Frank went on, the fact that he was in that cove must mean that he has some connection with the house on the cliff. Statman, king of the smugglers, Tony whistled. You guys really get in some interesting situations. I'll bet that he's one of the fellows who chased Jones that day in the motorboat, Joe cried, and tried to kill him, Frank continued in thought. Let's get away from here. Chet urged. Why should we go now? Frank demanded. We've stumbled on something important. That hidden pond may be the smuggler's base. But if they use the house, how do they get to it? Tony asked. Those cliffs up from the pond were mighty steep. There must be some other way that we couldn't see, Joe said. What say we hang around here for a while and find out what we can? Tony caught the Hardy's enthusiasm and agreed to keep the motorboat in the vicinity of the cliff. That fellow may be keeping an eye on us, and we don't want him to know what we're that we're watching the place, Frank observed. Let's run back to the bay and cruise up and down a while, then return. Chet sighed. I'm glad none of you argued with that armed man. Right, Joe replied. As it is, he must think we're simply out for a cruise and wander into the tunnel by mistake. Yes, his brother agreed. If he'd have known we were hunting for dad, he might have acted very differently. In the late afternoon, Tony took the Nepali back to the suspect shore spot, suspected shore spot. Keeping well out from the breaking waves, he cruised along the cliff. The boys kept a sharp eye on the location of the tunnel. As the boat passed it, they were just able to distinguish the narrow opening in the rocks. I won't be able to go in there after a while, Tony remarked. The tide's coming in. At high tide, I'll bet that tunnel was filled with water. Suddenly, Tom, Tony swung his craft so hard to the right that the other boys lost their balance. Sorry, fellas, he said. Saw a lot. Oh, he shut off the engine in a flash and leaned over the gun well. His companions picked themselves up and asked what happened. Propeller started to foul up with some wire on that log. Tony began to peel off his clothes. Get me some pliers, will you? Frank opened a locker and found a pair. Taking them, Tony dived overboard. A minute later, he reappeared and climbed in. I'm lucky, he said. Just plain lucky. Two seconds more and all of that wire would have been wound around the prop, and the log would have knocked it off. Good night, Chet exclaimed. It would have been a long swim home. Joe slapped Tony on the back. Good work, boy. I'd hate to see that the Nepali out of commission. Chet and Frank hauled the log aboard so it would not damage any other craft. This is a fence post with barbed wire, Chet said. Wow, we... It's good you spotted that log, Tony. Tony dressed and then started the engine. He cruised around for more than an hour, but the boys saw no sign of life about the base of the cliff. They could see the pilot house, but to their amazement, no lights appeared in it as twilight came. How much longer do you think we should stay out here, Chet asked. I'm getting hungry. I have a few pretzels and a candy bar, but that's not much for four of us, Joe remarked. Aha, cowed Tony, I have a surprise for you. I stowed away a little food before we took off. With that, he pulled out a paper bag from the locker and passed each boy a large sandwich, a piece of chocolate cake, and a bottle of lemon soda. You deserve a medal, Chet remarked as he bit into a layer of ham and cheese. You sure do, Frank agreed. I think we should stay right here for a while and watch. It's my guess the smugglers will be on the job tonight. Don't forget that the Marco Polo is docking tomorrow morning. I get it, said Chet. 
If she lays offshore or steams in slowly, it'll give Ollie Singh a chance to drop the stolen drugs overboard to Snapman. Correct, said Frank. Tony looked intently at the Hardys. It's your idea to keep Stat Snapman from meeting Ollie Singh? But what about your father? I thought we came out here to get a line on how to rescue him. The brothers exchanged glances and then Joe said, Of course, that's our main purpose, but we hope that we can do both. Twilight deepened into darkness and lights could be seen here and there though, through the haze. The cliff was only a black smudge and the house above was still unlighted. Suddenly, the boys heard a muffled sound. Tony slowed the Nepali and they listened intently. Another motorboat. Tony whispered. The sound seemed to come from near the cliff. Straining their eyes in that direction, the four were at last able to distinguish a faint moving light. Can you head over that way, Tony? Frank asked in a low voice. And could you take a chance on turning off our lights? Sure. Here goes. The wind blowing from the land so our engine won't be heard from the shore. The boys were tense with excitement as the Nepali moved slowly towards the light. As the boat crept nearer the cliff, they could barely distinguish the outline of a motorboat. The craft seemed to be making its way carefully out of the very face of the cliff. It must have come from that tunnel, Joe whispered to Frank. Yes. The Nepali went closer in imminent danger of being discovered or being washed ashore onto the rocks. Finally, the other boat slowed to a crawl. Then came the faint clatter of oars and low voices. The motorboat had evidently met a rowboat. The next moment, with an abrupt roar, the motorboat turned and raced out to sea at an ever-increasing rate of speed. Where can it be going? said Tony in amazement. Out to meet the Marco Polo? Probably, Frank replied, and we'll never catch it. I wonder where the rowboat's going. The four boys waited in silence for several minutes. Then the rattle of oars came again. This time the sound was closer. The rowboat was coming towards them. What do we do now? Tony asked. Turn off your engine, Frank whispered. Tony complied. Through the gloom, Suddenly came snatches of conversation from the rowboat. A hundred pounds, they heard a man say harshly, and then the rest of the sentence was lost. Then there was a lengthy murmur of voices. I don't know, it's risky. The wind died down just then, and two voices could be heard distinctly. Ollie Singh's share, one man was saying. That's right, we can't forget him, the gruff voice replied. I hope they get away. All right. What are you worrying about? Of course they'll get away. We've been spotted, you know. It's all your imagination. Nobody suspects. Those boyettes at the house. Just dumb kids. If they come nosing around, we'll knock them in the head. I don't like this rough stuff. It's dangerous. We've got to do it or we'll end up in the pen. What's the matter with you tonight? You're nervous. I'm worried. I got a hunch we'd better clear out of here. Clear out, replied the other con the other contemptuously. Are you crazy? Why, this place is as safe as a church. The man laughed sardonically. Haven't we got all the squealers locked up? And tonight we make the big cleanup and getaway. Well, maybe you're right, said the first man doubtfully, but still. His voice died away as the boat entered the tunnel. Joe grabbed Frank's arm. Did you hear that? All the squealers locked up? I'll bet Dad's one of them, and he's a prisoner somewhere around here. And this is the hideout of Snapman and the other smugglers he was after, Frank added. I don't like this, Chet spoke up. Let's leave here and get the police. Frank shook his head. It will take so long we might goof the whole thing. Tell you what, 
Joe and I will follow that rowboat through the tunnel. How? On foot or swim. I don't think it's deep along the edges. You mean Chet and I will wait here, Tony asked? No, Frank answered. You two beat it back to Bayport and notify the Coast Guard. Tell them we're on the track of smugglers and ask them to send some men here. And tell them our suspicions about Ali Singh and the Marco Polo, Joe added. Then they can radio the captain to keep an eye on him. Okay, said Tony. I'll do that. First, I'll put you ashore. Don't go too close or you'll hit those rocks and wreck the boat, Frank warned. Joe and I can swim ashore. Then we'll work around into the tunnel and see what we can find. If we do discover anything, we'll wait at the entrance and show the men from the Coast Guard where to go when, we, when they get here. Tony edged the boat as close to the dark shore as he dared without lights. Quickly, Frank and Joe took off their slacks, t-shirts, sweaters, and sneakers. They rolled them up with twine, which Tony provided, tied the bundle on top of their heads, then they slipped over the side into the water. The Nepali sped off. Frank and Joe were only a few yards from the rocks and after a short swim emerged on the mainland. Well, here goes, with Joe whispered, heading for the tunnel. And that's the end of chapter 11. Thank you for joining me. See you next time.